Thank you for watching our presentation on the impact of federated authentication on user experience, privacy, and learning analytics. Um, I'm Margaret Heller, and I'm joined by Hong Ma. We're from Loyola University Chicago. Uh, today, we're going to give a, an overview of the user experience that has traditionally been offered for access to licensed resources and how that has always affected privacy and learning analytics. We're also going to give some information on how um, newer technologies um, and federated authentication have the, are impacting that, um, what's happening right now, and what we want the library community to be doing in the future. So these are some older but still in existence uh, user experiences for remote access to licensed content. Um, back starting in the early 70s, there were things like mediated access to online search services that, that expert searcher librarians um, performed those searches. Now that is, of course, far less common to have that kind of mediated access. It still does happen in some way. If you think about, for example, someone calls up the reference desk and, and asks to have a PDF emailed to them. Um, there's also access via an individual username and password or a username and password that's used an, on an institutional level. That is also still in use, but is very, very challenging to use in an institutional context. Um, IP-based, range-based authentication is still a critical piece of our infrastructure for, for offering access to licensed content. Um, this allows anyone on campus to have access without really doing anything else. However, um, it does not work so well when people are not on campus. Um, and so that brought us things like Easy Proxy, which was first created in 1999 and bought by OCLC in 2008. Well, this allows you to give your vendors the Easy Proxy IP address and then send all your traffic through that proxy server, which creates a single sign-on experience across all databases, even from off campus. And it can, of course, work with a number of authentication technologies to create SSO with other systems as well. So all of these different systems have more direct or indirect impact on privacy and the big data aspects that make them attractive for learning analytics. Obviously, when it's just one individual providing access through mediated searches, that's not going to be um, big data. But once you start getting into things like IP address and certainly proxy servers, and you are channeling um, traffic in different ways, you can start to create more and more data sets that can be used in different ways and have implications for privacy. So before we get into talking about um, newer technologies and federated authentication, um, I want to um, point out that there's three distinct stages of access and it's important to keep this in mind as we're having these discussions. Um, I also wanna point out that we're talking about federated authentication um, authenticating across, uh, across services, but we are also referring to federated identification connecting across domains as well. So identification is the um, specific entity, like an individual, um, and information about that individual. Authentication is um, the, how that person or entity um, proves that they really are who they say they are, and then authorization is what they're allowed to do once they're authenticated. So that's easy to do on an, on a, an individual um, institutional context. This can be fairly easy. Once you're trying to connect across systems and or create some kind of federated, um, federated authentication, that's where you need new technology to come into place. So here's some, um, some uh, kind of an overview of some different technologies that make federated authentication possible. Um, so CMO, um, it was first created as a standard in 2003. Its current version um, 2.0 was created in 2005. And this helps exchange authentication and authorization information across domains and platform for a single sign-on experience. OAuth 2.0 is another protocol used for exchanging authorization information. And it often uses the OpenID Connect standard for providing authentication, though it doesn't have to. And applications um, or user experiences may combine these methods in various ways, um, often in ways that are completely invisible to the user. For that reason, um, it's, it's important to really point out that what is available to, for libraries to use and how the different technologies interact really depends on local decisions that have been made at your institution. Libraries can really never make their own decisions independent of their institutions. And so 
if you are working in a library, you need to be part of those conversations. You need to be finding out who is making those decisions and be part of that. Um, understand what is available to you. I also want to mention um, some, some important considerations um, when you're using any kind of federated authentication technology when it comes to attributes and privacy. So attributes are information about an entity, like an individual user, that can be passed across systems. So this can be information like individual usernames or email addresses that is very obviously tied to a specific individual. So you really have to watch out for what information is being released and how it's being used so that you're not accidentally releasing um, very individual information to, across systems that can be used in different ways without your knowledge. The other thing is it might seem tempting to use attributes for learning analytics. So if you can get very granular pieces of information about um, a person, you could, for example, find out what database everyone in a certain class is using. Um, but really you need to keep your analytics at a much higher level than this. Um, so you, you really are not wanting to get down to that granular a level when you're doing, when you're passing attributes, unless you absolutely need to for some reason. If you're running some sort of study for uh, learning analytics, you really, that involves any kind of individually identifying information with library systems, you need to do so very thoughtful and you need to do so under IRB supervision. And there's initiatives like um, CAR, which is a consent, uh, consent to release attributes from internet to, that are trying to make this more obvious to users. So we might know what is being released about users, but they may have no idea. And so this kind of, this is, um, a way that you can potentially show users what you're releasing about them and make sure that they're consenting to it. Um, I also want to mention another thing that comes up a lot in this discussion is that a lot of times you can be authorized to use a database, but then if you want to um, personalize your experience, there are either required or optional personal accounts. So some databases do not allow you to use them unless you actually do create a, a, a personal account. And that can also be done using SAML and having single sign-on. Um, so when you are trying to set this up, you should be able to send data um, using your SAML connection that should allow those accounts to be provisioned using the same account that provides authorization to access the platform. So tying those two together um, and ideally using, um, using some sort of um, connection that is um, obvious to the user, but not, um, but maybe not, doesn't uh, hurt their privacy, but you have to be thinking about that. So you have, you have to um, be aware of what attributes your system releases and how those connect across platforms. What happens if you accidentally create multiple accounts? Um, how easy is it to merge those accounts? Um, I accidentally created two Patreon accounts myself, one um, with two OpenID Connect services, one Facebook and one Google, and I have two Patreon accounts and cannot get them remerged um, together. Um, so when you are communicating with users, you need to be clear on how such accounts um, affect their privacy. I'm not gonna talk, uh, turn it over to Hong, who will be talking about the current um, issues in federated authentication. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Margaret provided a pretty good overview about the authentication and the, um, uh, the, in general, remote access scenario user experience for our licensed content. So I, I bet you heard about the resource access for 21st century project and also um, kind of a seminar access. So the project that both, both initiative is the impact, impact, impact for them is really try to improve the remote access scenario. Margaret mentioned about the IP or authentication username password for a decade, right? The try to access the resources. But as uh, uh, we are uh, moving to the digital age, more scenario is like users really come to access the res those resources through the multiple devices, no longer just the computer. Um, the traditional IP-based authentication really, we force our researcher and the user come to the library website or circle back to find the proxy prefix the URL to try to access. But now really kind of a goal is aiming for delivery at the point of a discovery, no matter where they come from, from Google resource itself, they should be able to gain access right away. 
The second motivation for the project is improve the usability of access workflows. As again, Margaret mentioned those username password scenarios. It often require user numerous of click through or enter their credentials multiple times to try to access to the resources. So streamlining that uh, process is really important for user experience. Um, as she also indicated, there is a potential in addition to authorize to the resource itself. It can personalize, personalize user services and also potentially enhance the user privacy. Um, so here is a little overview about both projects and the services. So as I mentioned, RA21 was initiated in 2016 the, to aim explore the challenge of remote, remote access we are face, we will facing, uh, and also involved the, the stakeholders from multiple layer, including publishing, library, software, and the broader identity community. Um, the project identified that federal, federated authentication is the most promising solution for providing a robust, scalable solution for remote access to scholarly content. Um, the project also investigated the barriers to take up, developed this best practice, and piloted the technical approach to simplify the remote access. Uh, then um, in 2019, Seminate Access as the operational successor of the RA21 project was created as a community-driven effort. Uh, with the founding four, four major founding organizations listed here, they deliver op, uh, uh, operational services plus best practices and the standards for facilitating the uh, remote access to resources. Um, it include the the services include a full time uh, implementation team. It also has a, a, a few governance and advisory committees, again, including multiple stakeholders and the outreaching committee. So the Simnis Access and also Foundation the RE21 project really provide um, a good um, chunk of a solution for, for the access. So first one is where are you from is an essential part of a federated identity management workflow as Margaret mentioned at the beginning. But at the same time, so that will kind of offer user no matter which device, where they come from, they will have an opportunity to pick up their um, institution from the WAVE menu to, to pursue the access to anywhere. At the same time, waveless URLs can also be generated, similar like we have the, we had for decades, the proxy prefix the URL for user to bypass the wave menu, wave menu directly um, get to the login page to get access to the resources. So most use the library website. Um, so as, as mentioned before, the seamless access aims for streamlining online access experience. It, it has a standard require an institutional affili affiliation via access button. Um, sim seamless access also have a, a service called identify provide, provider discovery services, provides a standard method to look up your institution. Um, and also uh, another service is called per persistence services could store your institutional choices on your computer. Once you choose once you, in your local browser storage, you, you no longer need every time still go, go through the wave menu or just uh, choose your institution. Um, it offers, um, a, I believe is three level of integration options for services provider to integrate the, their the authentication with, with the seamless access. So, at least a few uh, library resource, library vendor examples there. But at the same time, still generate or facing uh, challenges. So the challenge one, as we all know, is um, user experience for the institutional authentication piece. One, one issue is user may even not know, understand the terminology of institutional authentication. Two is institutional login can be hard to find in the different, different resources. Also, third one is inconsistent experience across different sites. Um, challenge two, 
um, is some of you might already encountered. Um, when you come, come to this wave menu, you saw the duplicated institutional entry with the same display name, sure self. The reason is you, your institution may have a multiple identity and identity provider uh, registered with the same display name or for different federations. So in our case, we had uh, OpenSN is one federation. We also used to be in common uh, member, federation member. So that's a pretty common challenge um, for a lot of institutions. Challenge three um, is uh, because of a service provider, if even you layer down to the library uh, services provider, there could be inconsistent practice of uh, happening in their site. So libraries would have to navigate through the, those differences and the nuances in multiple layers. Um, so with all the current, uh, we give you a quick summary about the federal authentication and the well, where we are, how that kind of impact the library world. We come to this, this slide as, as a conclusion is what the library community needs to do. Um, and I would just lay out them in the following category. From knowledge aspect, we feel we all need have a basic level of understanding about what, what is a service provider, what is an identity provider, and what is a federation. Um, as Margaret mentioned in previous slides, attributes and why those attributes are important to privacy. And also another thing keep in mind is attribute release is optional. So it's totally under control of identity provider. It's not like a service provider can force you to release or just you have to put it there. So again, with this knowledge will help you understand, have a better control when come to your institution, uh, in institutional configuration. So for you locally, you needed to know the services your institution used for identity management. Also, you needed to know which federations your institution belongs to uh, or multiple federations, it could be the case. Also, know your option for authentication configuration. Um, understand what, what ex is exactly happening to a user come to, when it comes to the e-resource authentication and authorization. Um, we also want to use this opportunity to advocate relation, relationally we all, as a library, we need to stay updated with news and the new future of federal, federated identity management. We need to develop a collective understanding about the federal authentication and its in, implications for libraries. We really need to collectively build a community awareness about those impact and also the current challenges facing us. Um, and the last and, not, and also most is joining the SEMIS access community for library vo uh, voices. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, there are a lot of uh, different committees and working groups involving multiple uh, stakeholders from SEMIS access services. But however, we have a very few library um, participants there. I just want to quickly share my personal experience I um, last year, while well, we are in the middle part of uh, open essence implementation process, where I really fully uh, experienced a lot of uh, challenges. So I saw a call for participation about the same needs. Um, we uh, we disambiguation um, working group call for participation. That's caught my eye right away. So with like more than six months um, participation participating in that group, I really felt like I learned so much about the uh, much broader um, issues from the not just library wide. Um, those the what what's happening uh, for federal authentication. What uh, what other um, um, stakeholders have been doing and implementing. At the same time, I also felt like my contribution to that group is. I was able to contribute to the library consent um, and uh, a lot of uh, more, um, more um, experience or contact, context knowledge from library point of view. So um, we're really hoping this is a kind of, a, um, if you are listening to our session, you will kind of uh, get on board about 
um, get yourself familiar with uh, the, this entire um, um, involving um, 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 areas and then be able to join, um, build, start build, help us build the community and make the community stronger, and eventually not get left over for the for the future moving forward piece. Um, thank you so much for for coming to our our presentation. We also put a list of resources here, so feel free just dive into those too um, for for your further interest. Thank you.